Thanks for listening to the Swearing In Podcast, where you'll hear the origin stories of those who chose to serve. So ground your gear, take a seat, and listen up. The Swearing In Podcast starts right now. Hello and welcome in, everyone. And I don't like to expressly welcome all my brothers and sisters in service. This is the Swearing In Podcast, and I am your host, Marty Smith. Today is April 28th, 2022. Here is some military history on this date. In 1952, General Dwight D. Eisenhower was relieved of his post as Supreme Commander of the Combined Land and Air Forces of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO. This was done at Ike's own request so that he could enter politics. And later that year, Eisenhower was elected president. In 1965, in an effort to forestall what he claims will be a communist dictatorship in the Dominican Republic, President Lyndon B. Johnson sends more than 22,000 U.S. troops to restore order on the island nation. And in 1993, Secretary of Defense Les Aspen issues a directive allowing women to fly fighter aircraft in combat. That's some good history right there. But my guest today is Air Force retired Lieutenant Colonel Sean Masterson. Sean grew up in Dufer, Oregon. He graduated high school in 1993, then enlisted in the Air Force later that year. After completing basic training, he attended tech school at Shepard Air Force Base as a C-130 engine mechanic. His first assignment was with the 9th Special Operations Squadron at Eglin Air Force Base in Florida. In 1996, he exited active duty through the Palace Chase Program and joined a National Guard unit at Fairchild Air Force Base, Washington. During this time, Sean attended the University of Idaho and enrolled in the school's ROTC program. He graduated in 2001 with a psychology degree and was commissioned as a second lieutenant space and missile officer. Over the next 18 years, Sean moved from active duty to the reserves, then to an AGR position. He finished his career as the Director of Operations for the 26th Space Aggressor Squadron at Peterson Air Force Base, Colorado, then as the Commander, 926 Operations Group Detachment 1 at Hurlburt Field, Florida. He retired in 2019. So this concludes your pre-brief. Now let's get on and hear from Colonel Masterson. Joining me today is retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Sean Masterson. Sean, thanks for taking the time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Marty, for having me. I appreciate it as well. No, this is going to be fun. Um, okay, so where did you grow up? I grew up in a, in a very small town um, named Dufer, Oregon. It's about um, probably about an hour and, and a half east of um, Portland, Oregon, northern part of Oregon, central. So two hours north of where Jake Wall grew up. I was just going to yeah. ask. He was out there in that country yeah. too, right? Yeah, he was. It's about a town of like 500 people. I'm a super small little town, farming community. Um, I had 15 people in my graduating high school oh class. Oh, my God. One was my twin brother, so he didn't really even count. <laughs> and so we had 15 people, 11 boys, four girls, and um, 11 of us started kindergarten together. So you didn't date any of your classmates because they're kind of like your sister. And so it was a very, very small <laughs> community. Okay. Um, and everybody just kind of knew each other. And, yeah. and you know, there's probably – couple layers of cousins in there somewhere, but, um, <laughs> but it was, it was an interesting, um, it was an interesting way to grow up where, you know, my nearest neighbor is probably a mile away. So, you know, oh, kind of, man. kind of reserved, you know, your, your education was just as great as what you've been told or yeah. what you get on your four channels of TV. So, uh, uh, right, right. Yeah. And you know, everybody yeah. always thinks about that as like Kansas or Oklahoma yeah. or some yeah. area like that, that whole, portion um the eastern portion of oregon washington 
uh, really gets no play at all. But it, I, I didn't realize it was so rural as it is, right. as I've heard from other people as well. Yeah, it can be. Yeah, for sure. All right. So your senior year is coming around. You're big man on, on the campus. <laughs> <laughs> Only a few. Uh, <laughs> what are you so, thinking? Are you, are you thinking college or, you th- or, or what's going on? No, um, I, I should have not gave you the punchline. So, so morning, I graduated 11th in my class, which is very impressive, but I already told you there's 15 people. <laughs> um, so my twin brother was 10th, but he says he's 9th, but I think I'm pretty sure he was 10th. Okay. Um, I, I did not focus on school. I focused on football, yeah, you know, yeah. girls, you know, beer drinking, camping type stuff on the weekends, hunting. Um, so that was not uh, my future at all, college. And so I think I remember my junior year, I started thinking about it. I think my old man's like, hey, you guys need to start thinking about something. You're not going to sit around here and farm yeah. with me. Yeah. If you want to farm, you got to go do something else. And if you want to come back, we'll have that discussion. Okay. So I was like, you know, we don't, there, in Oregon, there's no military bases. I think Spokane, Washington, Fairchild is like five hours away. And then yeah, and that's Tacoma, a cool. Washington, yeah. McCord is four or five hours away. So there's, there's no military base. I didn't grow up with military people around me. Both my grandfather served in World War II, but as, as you know, that generation didn't talk about it much. Um, no, not much at all. Yeah, so I didn't know. And Did they, so even, send recru- Did they even send recruiters out? To no, they, 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 they didn't. <laughs> you know, it's not worth a, one out of 15, right? It's not worth it. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so, but we did go to, I remember going to a career fair when I was in high school and I ran into a Navy recruiter. I'm like, well, this is, you know, he sold it to me. I'm like, this is cool. I get to travel the world and yeah, yeah. I get to do kind of cool stuff. And, you know, I didn't realize I might have been on a boat for eight months, but it didn't matter. I'm like, <laughs> this is, this seems pretty neat because I, Air Force was not even an option because my simple mind from my small town, the only people, and this is going to sound so stupid, the only people in the Air Force went from the to the Air Force Academy and they only flew aircraft. That's that's, that's all. They, that's, that's the whole Air Force. I thought so too. I thought the yeah. same thing. I was like, well, there's nobody else except for pilots. So. Except for pilots, there's no cops, there's no personnel, there's no CE, <laughs> nothing. It's just pure pilots because that's how <laughs> ignorant I was, and. And so I'm like, I'm going to sign for the Navy. And I'm, I'm, I'm dead serious. I was going to do it. And, and then between my, I think it was later in my senior year, or in the beginning of my senior year, went to another career fair. And I, I had an Air Force recruiter. I started talking to him. I'm like, he's like, well, yeah, you could join the Air Force. I'm like, no. The only Air Force Academy. He's like, no. What, it's like smoking crack? Yeah, you could join the Air Force. <laughs> and so and now I'm really excited because I don't have to be on a boat. Yeah, yeah. And, and I really wanted the easiest one. Because I didn't want to sit in boot camp for 12 weeks. I'm like, yeah. oh, Air Force, six weeks. Boot sure. camp, I don't, I don't think we have to run. And so <laughs> this is a great, great opportunity. So I sign up and I was going to go off to basic training in June of 1993 after I graduated. Okay. And it got delayed because I, I was a pretty good football player. So I got picked up to play an all-star game. So they pushed me out to November. Well, my brother, my twin brother signed up in the Air Force too. After I did, his basic training was in November. So now all of a sudden, we're going to basic training the same day. Did you guys have discussions about doing it? I no. Mean, well, we, I, I think I started it, and then he's like, well, shit, I got nothing else going on. I might as well do it, too. And then we had another classmate, uh, Justin. He he went in the Air Force three months after we did. So oh, Wow. Um, so there was like three guys in our class that went in the military out of the 15. Yeah. yeah <laughs> that's, pretty a, awesome. that's a pretty so, good percentage. That's so a really good job the, uh, by the recruiters there. Yeah. And then, so we go off to basic training together in November of, of 93. And it was, it was strange because we, my brother and I were super competitive. So we got along, but we really didn't get along. Yeah. And then, so we show up to, well, let me back up. So on the way to basic training, they give you a voucher. I don't know if you got one. They give you a voucher for like $28 for food. Oh is, no, no, we never. Got it. So I was so army, so they they had they always had food, you know, <laughs> food, but they always had it. So, so they give us a voucher. So we're in the airport because you fly down, you go to Portland, Oregon the night before, you do all your map stuff, and you stay. They put you in a hotel. They want to yeah. make sure you stay in that hotel because they're yeah. going to put you on an airplane the next morning. Right. And so we're down there, and so they give us twenty eight dollar food voucher. So my brother and I thought it'd be a good idea just to drink beer at the airport in Dallas <laughs> on the way to San Antonio. Well, I don't know why we didn't get carded because we're in Texas, I guess. So we were sitting there and drank beer. We probably had four or five beers. I'm like, oh shit, we're 
we're actually going to basic training here in about six hours. <laughs> and we're, we, I'm sure we smell like beer. And so we show up. And so they bring us all in and we're, we're sitting there and they're like, hey, do, are, is there, are there any buddy programs? So back in the day, the Air, they had this buddy program where you and your buddy, for recruiting purposes, could go on the same flight together. Right. And nobody raised their hand like, are there any brothers here? And like my brother and I, you know, meekishly raised her hand. Do you guys want to be together? We're both like, I don't care. We still want to get yelled at. I don't care. Yeah. All yeah. right. You two are together. So yeah. we're, now we're on the same flight in basic training. There's 52 people. And in the Air Force, they have the bays. So like there's 25 beds on one side, 25 beds on the other side. And there's a wall between them. And him and I are both in the same flight. You know, they shave our heads and everything else. Yeah. About a week and a half into basic training. He's been it's the, the time they take you to the shop bed to go get your shaving cream and toothpaste and everything else. And we're like, Masterson, fall out. Both of us fall out. Uh huh. And that, I mean, Sergeant Kozar, I still remember in this day, he goes, You mean there's two of you fucking sons of bitches? He had no idea. <laughs> he had no idea there was twins in his flight. He just assumed it was one person. So, great. Anyway, so, so he gets recycled after about three weeks. My twin brother gets recycled. Why? I don't even know where he, we still don't know. We still don't know. <laughs> Do you think There's it was because orders. of that, that sergeant? No, so evidently, he was putting, like, he found a bunch of screws and bolts somewhere in the dorms. He put them in the flight, the element leader's shoes, because he hated them. And so he put his shoes on first thing in the morning. Anyways, we don't know the whole story, Marty. We probably never will. <laughs> he, gets, he gets recycled back a week. And so come graduation time, which I feel like an ass about this, Come graduation time, and I know you went through Army, but security was a big thing in basic training. So yeah. they would teach you, like, in levels about security. I know you had to lock up your wall locker. Yeah. Like, after so many weeks, you could do visual confirmation to let somebody from your other flight into your room. Otherwise, you had to show your ID yeah. into yeah. the dorms. So I'm, I'm graduating. My brother's a week behind me. I'm going to Wichita Falls, Texas. Going to go tell him goodbye. So I go upstairs. He's one level above me. I go upstairs. The guy sees me, lets me in. I go say hi to my brother. Hey, I'm leaving tomorrow. The, the, the dorm guy, the head dude, the, the TI goes, who just let this guy in? This guy's like you. He gets recycled back two <laughs> weeks for security violation because he thought we we're the same person. <laughs> so, Holy shit. I felt bad for about a day. And then <laughs> anyways, I was like, you should have checked my ID, dude. Should have checked it. So <laughs> anyways, that's all my whole basic training story. And so we had both end up in. In Wichita Falls, um, I, I was a C-130 engine mechanic, so I went to school. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. How'd you get that job? Did you sign a contract for that job? I signed a contract for open maintenance. Okay. Um, and I think my brother did as well. And so... Any bonus with that or no? No. Oh. I've never seen a bonus in my life. Uh, open what, Open yeah. maintenance? Open open maintenance. Okay. Um, mechan- I think I think it's called mechanics. I'm not sure. But Did you find out for certain uh, there at basic that when they come yeah. in and do the big reveal for you? No. So tech school, once, once you – no, that's not true. You're right. Basic training, they give you a laminated binder, and you can flip through the jobs, right? Yeah. yeah. All the maintenance jobs. And I'm looking which one's got the shortest tech school. That's all I cared about, shortest <laughs> tech school. And I remember my first pick was um, – <laughs> it was it was boat maintenance. Boat? Boat. So the MWRs on, on oh, these bases have boats. That's right. Yeah, that's right. You, know, you know, the Air Force guys would fix these boats. I'm like, the tech school was like three weeks. I'm like, that's the one I want. <laughs> and so, and then so I didn't, I didn't get it. And I think uh, C-130s was four months, I think. So I, I took second pick, third pick, whatever. Yeah. So yeah. I, got, I got 130s. I was an aircraft engine mechanics for 130s, and then so I go off to to Shepard, and so we were the first class. My class was the first class at Shepard Air Force Base when they moved it from Chanute oh. down to Shepard Air Force Base. And oh, okay. evidently my picture's still on the wall um, of wow. the very first class that went through there. And oh. <laughs> I think it was, we, so we started in January. So we graduated in April of, of 93, I believe. Yeah, early April of 93 is when we graduated from tech school. So April. it was it was interesting. It was, you know, hey, Texas. Did you, you say April... 93 or 94? I'm sorry, 94. April 94 is when okay. I graduated. Yeah. Okay. So, but, um, yeah, so that was, you know, I'm, and I grew up, you know, turning wrenches on the farm and stuff. I want to say I'm a great mechanic, but I could thumb my way. And I know what a crescent wrench is. <laughs> and so, you know, so it, I actually enjoyed it. And 
and it came time to start picking where you wanted to go, right? You know, your dream assignment. And so I had a girlfriend back home. So I picked, yes. it's kind of funny, girlfriend back home. So I picked McCord, I picked oh, Fairchild, I picked Mountain Home, and then probably some Northern California base because it's all within driving. Distance. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm like, yeah, I'm going to stay close to home. So my twin brother, he doesn't want to be anywhere close to home. So he picks like North Carolina, Florida, Germany, Italy, whatever. Yeah, you could go right. anywhere, right? So C-130 Mechanic, they haven't had a tech school in over a year. So all of the 130 guys, all of the first three or four classes, all went to Herbert Field or England <laughs> or Special Ops. It just, they, they got first pick. So we all got there. Wow. So I got the exact opposite of where I wanted. My brother who picked everywhere else got Mountain Home, Idaho. So, You're kidding. No. <laughs> so, he didn't start so, dating your girlfriend, did he? Well, I don't know, Marty. <laughs> it's probably in the secret trove of what he got recycled too. So maybe. Um, but yeah, I did, it was just interesting how the Air Force worked, which, which I look back on. I'm like, I'm really glad I got away from home. Sure. And, you know, because I loved Eglin. I mean, you've, you've been down here, I'm sure, and it's it's well, despite your yeah, despite your better judgment, if it had all gone your way. Uh, you would have been a boat mechanic kid. <laughs> boat mechanic on the water somewhere, probably. Probably. Um, Alaska, my, my guess. But, um, but yeah, it just it just kind of worked out. And, and uh, Heck yeah. I'm super happy about it. And I, I met some phenomenal friends because, you know, all the classes in tech school all went together. So oh, they did. Okay. Were, okay. Yeah. So the whole entire class, all but one of us, went to the ninth Special Operations Squadron, which is where I was. Um, and we had one guard guy or whatever, but he went back you know, at the guard unit or whatever. Yeah. But, and then one guy went to Herbert Field and, and then all the classes right behind us all were Eglin or Herbert Field, depending on the, the, the unit they went to. So, so it was good. It's a good experience. So Herbert was your first assignment. Uh, it was actually Eglin. So I was part oh, of Herbert Oh, I'm sorry. Eglin. Yeah. Eglin. There was one squadron of C-130s on Eglin, which was the ninth. The rest of them on Herbert Field or Duke Field. And I was on Eglin. So it was great. You weren't, you weren't around all the headquarters stuff. And, um, yeah, but, yeah. And so you're kind of your own little, you know, mafia there. And, um, oh. which was great because the entire third floor of the dorms was only for the nine special operations water. Oh. So it was crew chiefs, hydraulics, engines, you know, sheet metal. Yeah. And so yeah. it was a party, Marty. I mean, just oh, absolutely disgusting God. party. Lord of the Flies, like, I mean, I, it was disgusting. I, I, I can't imagine coming from central Oregon through Texas. And then now you're st- sitting on the beach with a bunch of special op guys all clamored together. Oh, the weekends had to be insane. Oh, and come spring break all the way through September. <laughs> it was God. it was disgusting. I mean, I, I, first of all, I don't know why. How come I don't weigh like 300 pounds? Second of all, we just, it was, you know, it was, we're, we're a bunch of, we're 18 year olds. We're just a yeah. bunch of kids. Yeah. It was great. Yeah, that's. So, I mean, that, you had the whole world in front of you, man. And, and yeah, like exactly. it, was, it was a long. It was a long spring break for three years. <laughs> <laughs> what were your uh, duty assignments when you got there? I mean, obviously working on a plane, but uh, were there a lot of deployments? Were you what, did that squadron deploy a lot or no? Yeah, we, we did deploy a lot. And it was, so we had we had standing rotations to Interlake, Turkey. Uh, which I was able to catch two of them in my time there. And there's so many young airmen. So we all kind of had to take our time. We all wanted to go. Yeah. Because we, you know, I remember I think my paychecks were like $350 every two weeks. Yeah. Right? And right. then you go to Turkey where per diem is $40 a day. Gee. Well, you were loaded. Like, <laughs> I mean, you were absolutely loaded at $40 a day. Like, I'm a rich man. I got I to go to Turkey. Yeah. And so, but the ongoing joke was, you know, this is before cell phones, this is before internet, right. this is before computers. Right. Is you don't pick up your phone on the weekend. Oh because no. Because it's probably it's probably the shop calling you and say, pack your bags, you're leaving. Yeah. And you never know. It could be a sweetheart deal or it could be a bad one. And my first one was not a good one. Oh really? <laughs> so I get picked up 1994, September. I've only been there six months. Yeah. You know, we're all drinking Friday night, all drinking, having a good time in the dorms and pick up the phone Saturday morning, like pack your bags, you're leaving. I'm like, where are we going? They're like, shut up. Just get down here. Whoa. So I get down there, Cuba, six weeks in Guantanamo Bay during the Haitian conflict. Wow. Um, so I'm down there. I, I go down there. I don't want, you know, and it's, we were sleeping in a hangar 
with 600 dudes in this hangar with one bathroom, one toilet. That's it. It was disgusting. And this, oh, is, this is September. Uh, that, had be, that had to be hot. Oh, it had to be terrible. messy. Oh, God. So we would work nights, you know, because we would launch, we would launch at late afternoon, yeah. early evening, and we'd recover at night. And so you slept during the day, and then they have these two little Delta Force helicopters that parked right outside the hangar. They would take off every morning, and you're trying to sleep. It's, you know, oh. it's 100% humidity. You're a cot with a mosquito net over you. And I have this little, you know, this little fans that you clip on something. Yeah. Yeah. And I clip it in, it was about four inches from my face and just blow in my face. I'm like, God, it was that and bad. It was just, ugh, God, I was miserable. And you had uh, mosquitoes too in the hangar? What's that? You had mosquitoes in the hangar? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because the doors would be open. Yeah, yeah. So they wouldn't shut the doors. I mean, just to try to get some air blown through there. But there's this pallets at MREs. If you're hungry, go to the pallet. Get something uh-huh. to eat. They didn't have so, alcohol or, or anything like that? They did later, um, probably like week five, probably about a week before we left. They finally got the chow hall. They got Tent City built up. Yeah. But we, we were gone like a week after that. And <laughs> that's when I learned the difference between rank, um, between um, my shop chief went down there, Master Sergeant Coiner, great dude, old dude, you know, just kind of big old pot belly, Master Sergeant type of guy you would see him walking around with like a big, huge coffee cup that's twice the size of his hand. Yeah, yeah. That guy. And we, he loved the chow hall. I'd say he was kind of portly dude. <laughs> loved the chow hall. This is when the chow hall was open. The chow hall opened at seven. And then we had tasks to go over and build tents with the army. I think it was a D cell. Is that what, like our equivalent to CE? So we show up and we go eat our breakfast. He likes his breakfast. So we, we go over there. We show up about 735 and we had to be there at 730 to help build these tents. And this E five or E six just started yelling at us, screaming at us. And this is back, you know, early nineties where we didn't have stripes or name tags. It was just that leather patch that went on your BDUs. Oh yeah. Yeah. So you couldn't see rank or anything else. And so we roll in there and he starts screaming at myself and I start to corner. And I'm, I think I'm, I think I'm a one striper at the time. Oh shit. So he just starts screaming at us. He's telling me to drop and give him 50 pushups or anything else. And I remember Master Sergeant Coiner, and Master Sergeant Coiner looks at him and he goes, we're not doing that. He goes, you will do exactly what I tell you. God damn it, son of a bitch. Starts screaming at him and goes, he goes, we're in the Air Force. We don't do push-ups. <laughs> That's what he said. Nice. And I looked at him, and then the guy kind of got close to him and saw he was an E-7. Nice. And the, his tone got real quiet. But I looked at him like, way to go. And, and you know, I kind of looked at him getting a smart. And he looked at me and goes, don't smart. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought it was pretty tough the rest of the day. After that one, but yeah, that's pretty badass. So, but six, you know, six weeks, six or seven weeks over there. But that's what happens when you pick up your phone on a weekend. Yeah. You yeah. don't do it. I mean, don't they give you some notice beforehand or or, or not? Or is it just no, it's, no, it comes up? No, yeah, it just comes up. And so they'll run through the, and by the way, I was the third phone call that day. So they call oh. my buddy Wilk, they called Kevin, they called Hart, and I happen to be the guy that actually answered the phone. Oh, the the, so, but your buddies make fun of you. I'm like, ah, uh-huh, you picked up the phone, <laughs> dumbass. Did you get? Did you get uh, promotion points or anything like that? By, at least by uh, deploying. Absolutely not. Oh, shit. <laughs> Absolutely not. Well, at least so, you get the money, I guess. I suppose. I got tax free for yeah. um, tax free of three hundred dollars a month. See, let me add that up. Yeah, wasn't much. So. <laughs> But but there was there was an op- another opportunity where I picked up the phone and it got me a trip to Spain I think for road to Spain for four days and so but there was a lot of these onesie twosies but the turkey rotations were phenomenal glorious it was like you and your buddies camping really two months you know it was big big tent city but they've you know they they fashioned these tents with like rooms with plywood rooms and yeah yeah and you know we had two planes over there. At all times, and one had to be ready to go at all times for search and rescue. Okay. So if something broke. You can't fly the other plane, but if you're waiting on a part, you may be out for two days, and it's just yeah. it's just buffoonery. And they had all these these hooches. <laughs> so the, we had a green beret bar, which was our hooch, and then the tankers had a the tanker bar had a hooch, the Brits had a hooch, and they had then we go all these bars, these tent bars. That you just wow. 
just roam around in the middle of the night like alley cats <laughs> to these these places. And you know, the beers were always a dollar. Didn't matter what it was. It didn't yeah. matter if it was the a Heineken or a Keystone Light. It was one dollar. Okay. And so it would just and then you, everybody would wait until about five o'clock, and somebody would ring a horn, and then everybody had their beers ready to go. Oh, wow. As soon as they ring the horn, you guys are off, off call. <laughs> Drink your beers, and we're good till next day. So, yeah, it, it was a great opportunity. And things and, were just so cheap in Turkey, just incredibly cheap. Did they let you off compound? Did you get to go see <laughs> Insulik or anything like that? Oh yeah, so we we were allowed. We had a curfew, and I don't remember what it was. I mean, it was midnight or something like that. It wasn't bad, but yeah, we go downtown as much as we want, as much or as little as we want, but we'd go down there and eat a lot because I mean, you could literally oh, okay. go in and, and go to like this beef kebab place and you get like three beers, a beef kebab, some French fries and be like $2.20. Oh yeah. I mean, nice. it, was just, it was stupid cheap and like gold back then in the early nineties was super cheap. So I remember we we're all flying back home and customs would come on the plane and Everybody's got their Mr. T starter kit, you know, underneath their <laughs> underneath their shirt, so hiding all the gold they brought back to their family members, right. necklaces, and everything else. But it was just everything was just so inexpensive, and for a young airman who didn't make any money, yeah, it was just a neat opportunity to you know do some sightseeing, to go and kind of explore and sort of like go to Donna and some of the other places with some buddies wow. and, and just and really enjoy it. And they had a they had a golf course, which really oh. well, I kind of learned how to play. They had a little nine hole golf course on Interlake, and it was ten dollars a month. As much as you could play. Oh man! And so, John Bernice, this um, hydraulics guy, he would drag me out every morning at seven a.m. and we'd go play eighteen holes every morning. And then huh. Saturday we'd play thirty-six holes. And so, well, no we better just, way to learn the game than yeah. It was, it was a great opportunity. Anyway. Oh, was there any kind of FP con or for traveling around the country or anything at that time? Oh, if there was, <laughs> I was not aware. Um, but I know I don't think so because they had a lot of MWR trips and stuff like that that you could go. Yeah, and um, check out some stuff. We went to somewhere and I can't remember. It was it was a full day trip of which I, I found interesting. And me being a farm kid from Oregon, like we rented, we had a van, and then we had like a Turkish interpreter driver, and we went to a couple places. Mersin was one of them. I can't remember. It was like on the Mediterranean. We went to some place where the Romans is like this huge pit where the Romans would throw in prisoners and it's like, you know, four or five stories down. They call it heaven or hell, I think is what it was called or whatever, but it was kind of touristy stuff. And, um, but I remember we were driving and we had a big, huge cooler full of beer. I and mean, there seems to be a thing here, right? And there's <laughs> a huge cooler beer. And like, we'd like, all right, we got to piss. So the guy would just pull over the freeway and we're all sitting on the side of the freeway. And I have a picture somewhere. I'm just all, just all pissed on the side of the freeway. Yeah. And, yeah. And nobody cares. And how many times you go over to Turkey? Just at once? Twice, twice. Oh, twice. Two, two sixty day. I think. I think there were sixty day rotations. So let's see. So ninety four. Oh, what ninety seven? You're getting out of there? Yeah, late ninety six. I palace chased, um, and I went. And I wanted to go to school. Um, I wanted to um, go and get an education. I felt like I grew grew up a little bit, so I wanted to go to get an education. And um, so I palace chased and went into. The, the guardian of a Fairchild, Washington, knowing that I was going to go to school at the University of Idaho, which was about five hours north of where I grew up. And I have an aunt and uncle that live up there. Um, so I, Palace Chase, went into the reserves, I'm sorry, the guard, and then I went back to the farm and, and worked, <laughs> worked until school would start back in August. And so I had to get the, my biggest problem was I had to get accepted into the University of Idaho. And let me go back to the fact that I was 11th out of my class out of 15. And so <laughs> my uncle was a dean at the University of Idaho at oh. the School of Agriculture. And so this is how bad it was, Marty. He had to write three letters, not one, not two, but three letters to get me into the University of Idaho, which a lot of people refer to as public Ivy. Actually, nobody does, but it's not hard to get in there. <laughs> okay. And so three letters to get me in there. And so uh, I got in there, and you know, you know, four years later, I'm a, I, I did the ROTC program. Oh, you did? Okay, I, I did. Yep. Four years later, I graduated. Uh, my twin brother did the same thing, and we actually got commissioned together. So, basic oh. training together, commissioned together. Um, was, that, was that was uh, that a pre-planned kind of thing to do? No, it was not. And he started he started before I did, and he's like, he was, you should look into this. I mean, this is a pretty good program there. Yeah. This is this is late '90s, early 2000s, and you know, OTS opened wide up and ROTC opened wide up. And so they were taking anybody. Well, ROTC um, used to have, and I, and I don't know how Palace Chase plays into that because I was an ROTC guy 
Um, but I remember they used to have uh, SNP or something like that, simultaneous military program. Or, uh, but I think you were enlisted and still in. But I, I thought you were a reserve, but you got paid as an E five or something. Yeah, that's like the bootstrap bootstrap program, which, oh, which I did yeah. not do. Okay. Okay. Um, so they actually, I was still in. I still had an obligation to the guard when I went to field training, which is usually the summer between your sophomore yeah. and junior year. So I had to get discharged out of the guard because I couldn't be in two statuses at the same time. So they actually released me from the guard so I could go to field training and then, you know, eventually commissioned in, in 2001. So well, now you had no obligation to go back in the military. I mean, you had, you could have used GI bill and just got your degree and then went about your business. Yeah, um, I could have. Why did you determine, why did you join ROPC? Uh, well, first, first, why did you, what occurred to you to just go, hey, this is, it's enough two and a half years or three years of this, uh, let's go, go to school. You know, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. I think my, my brother jumped first and the idea of going and getting an education, which my aunt and uncle um, harped on a lot growing up. Sure. Um, seemed seemed reasonable. It seemed, you know, I get my GI bill, so I get paid while I go to school. Yeah. Um, ROTC offers you obviously a scholarship as well. And so it was to me, it just seemed natural. I don't want to say natural, um, but I, I felt like it was in time in my life that I needed to do something different. Okay. Um, I saw and no, no slight on people that I worked with, but I saw a lot of young, young people when I was enlisted would, you know, they meet a girl, they, they get together, yeah. they're, they're, they have a kid and now they're stuck yeah. right now. They, they have to provide. Which, and, and I don't think there's nothing wrong with that, but I didn't want to get myself in a position. I'm, you know, I'm 21 years old. Yeah. I really wanted to go do something else. And I really love the air force. I, I loved it. Oh, okay. um, if they gave me assignment to Turkey before I decided to get out, I probably would have taken it. Cause I loved it so much over there. Um, and that's why I, just, that's why I yeah. ask is, um, you seem to have liked it, but yet you wanted to get out. Um, but was it, I'm going to get out to become an officer to come back in? Was that, no, that, did, that did not cross my mind at all. Oh, okay. Um, I was going to go get my degree and then, um, well, I was going to go to college. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And figure it out from there. And then ROTC is like, oh, I get a, I get a guaranteed job when I get out. I, I know the Air Force. It's easy. I know what rank means. I know how things operate. So that'd be an easy transition for me out of college. Right. And so maybe I'm lazy. Maybe it was just because I was lazy. I'm like, <laughs> now that I know, I'm like a psychologist, Marty. Maybe I'm like, maybe I'm lazy. That's why I did it. Yeah, maybe. Uh, I mean, who knows? Back then, you know? I mean, <laughs> you know, I think we all have hindsight and look back and, and maybe would have done things differently. I, I don't know if I would have. Um, I don't know if I could have made any better decisions. Um, no, it sounded no, like, sound like it all worked out really well. It, it just, I think it just worked out. Maybe I'm just an extremely lucky person, but I didn't put a lot of thought in some of the stuff. I just, I, and by the way, when you're a young airman, you know, a, a two striper, three striper, you look at an officer and you just automatically assume they must make a million dollars a year, right? Because they, <laughs> you make, they make so much money and more money than you do. And so, oh. so maybe that had something to do with it too. Like, oh, well, I'm going to have, I'm going to have this great career and I'm, I'm going to make lots and lots of money. And you realize that lieutenants make about the same as a staff sergeant. Right? I, so. It's it's so disheartening. <laughs> we moved uh, five years ago, and I was like, I don't know why I'm carrying all this old shit around. And I started throwing out all these old papers and had an old LES statement from, like, being a first lieutenant. And I was like, oh, my God. How in the hell did we survive off of this, you know? We did it. Not very well. <laughs> but you figure it out, you know? Yeah, you figure yeah. it out. So, uh it comes time for uh, you you to be commissioned. How does your job choice selection go? You throw it, you know, is it the same? You put your top five or top 10 down and uh, your class ranking and all that stuff plays into that. Yeah, it, it, it does. And so your junior year, you start putting in for the jobs you want. And when I was coming up through, so you got to look at this, this is 2000. It might've been your fall. Your, your fall of your senior year. So two, 2000, um, and they were given away pilot slots. I'm like, like if you want to oh. be a pilot and you medically were clear to be a pilot, you get a pilot slot. I and mean, it's just, that's how easy it was. Oh, wow. Um, initially signed up for a pilot slot. So 
Um, let me yeah. rewind. So personally, I so I got married between my sophomore and junior year. Oh, congratulations! And, yeah, um, and we were expecting my son, my oldest, who graduates from Florida State University in two weeks. Um, oh wow! He he was going to be born in the spring of two thousand one. So right before I got commissioned. Okay. And so I was. I want to say I was guaranteed, but I was essentially guaranteed. I mean, anybody that signed a form that can pass visible, uh, you're going to get a pilot slot unless you completely just pooch the bed yeah. and you did something really, really bad. Okay. Um, and I wasn't that bad. So, <laughs> so everybody essentially got a pilot slot. Mine was coming because I was on the star program because I started RTC late, my, my beginning of my junior year. Yeah. And Oh, you didn't do the full four years. No, no, I did not do four years. So I did the star okay. program, which is two years. Okay. And, um, so, and I, I, I had the realization that I'm going to be a father here pretty soon. And I pulled my pilot application oh. right before he was born because I, all I had is a premonition like, well, I would want to go fly C-130s. I already know a lot about C-130s, so that's why I would fly. And hindsight was probably one of the best decisions I ever made because it was right after our commissions, 9-11 kicked off. Oh, and yeah, yeah. They were gone and they were gone and they were gone. Did you and get I, commissioned in 2001? In May of 2001, I was commissioned. Oh, wow. Um, so I became a space and missile officer. Okay. And instead, so I'm like, Ugh, take a pick. So I'm going through, I'm like, uh, I'll do contracting, I'll do this, whatever. And they're like, nope, space and missiles. Like, Son of a bitch. <laughs> and all I can picture is missiles. I didn't picture space. I just pictured missiles. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, Looks like I got a great story for you about that. And then okay, so I get commissioned and then we ended up at Dannenberg and then the son was born in February, commissioned in May. You had to wait 30 days after you commissioned, which was great. Go see some, some, some family report to Dannenberg in, in June, June. And then 9-11 kicks off September 11th, obviously. And then we were like in hold status. So wait a minute, you know, what's, this is wild. Uh, I was I was going through uh, was I going through OSPT or was I going through Civil's Fundamentals at Vandenberg when 2001 went off? Yeah, well, you and I were there together. We were at the same place. That's crazy. I was working. Uh, they they were training us on like a swing shift, so I was asleep. My sister called me and said, "Turn the TV on." I was like, "What are you talking about?" And I turned it on. I was like, what is going on? So we were both at Vandenberg together. That's that's small. That's small Air Force right there. That's great. My, my neighbor did the same thing. Turn the TV. I'm like, what the hell for? We got class. Are you right? <laughs> so, no, you do not. <laughs> so, so, you know, 9-11 kicked off, and then, um, which was great because we never had to wear blues again, it seemed like. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was awesome. So I started OSPT, which is – yeah. Um, same as what you went through, right? Right. And so in September, like 21st or whatever. And what did that stand for, for people who don't know? Because I, not everybody, oh, officer, officer. yeah, officers, officer space prerequisite training. Are you I think they refer to it now as like space 100. Training. Yeah, it's, it's changed. Yeah. yeah, right, right. Yeah. So the classes were small, they were like 13 people. Um, and then every week or two, their new class would get pushed through. And then once you finish, I think it was six or eight weeks you got shredded out. So either you went Sibbers or you went launch right. or you went GPS or you went missiles. When you get bank, you show up there, you show up and you get duty. Like you're either working at the JAG office or you're working over at CE and you're just a second lieutenant wandering around, don't know your ass from your hand until your class starts. And so I got assigned across the street and you probably remember this. There was the, the top hand program was across oh, the street yeah. from the school house. And yeah. so they had this little office over there or some guy, he figured it out. He's like, you know what? I'm going to take the initiative as a lieutenant. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to work with different organizations on the base. And I'm going to set up tours for all these lieutenants and the enlisted guys that huh. are going through ESPT. I think you guys called it ESPT, didn't you? I did. Yeah. Yeah. All these guys. And so when they're between their, between their OSPT and before they go to missiles or before their space assignment, we're going to take them to all these different organizations on base. And we, we take them and show them the, the you know, the Sibbers trainings, the, the schoolhouse there. We take them out and show them a launch pad and we take them all these other okay. places. Yeah. So I'm banked. I'm waiting for my classes to start till September. This is June. And so oh, 
what I would do is we had four people and what we do is we'd set up all these tours for these lieutenants. And then it took us about maybe four hours of work to do this. And we would do this every other class that went through. So every two weeks we'd push a class through and we'd have a full day of tours. So we had four guys in there and all we did for all day long is play spades all day long. <laughs> and then a new class would come through, dude, we set up all the, we set up all the tours. We already made all the contacts, set up all the tours, new class comes in. Yeah. And then we do the tours. It take about a day for the, all the different tours. And then we play spades all day. Well, one guy, he gets sent off to class. He's got to go to missiles. So I'm like, son of a bitch, we've only got three people. We can't play spades with three people. That's we true. called the front, said, hey, we're short a person. We're getting killed over here. Can you send <laughs> us another body? They sent us another body. We got another second lieutenant, and we had our force again. We just bust spades all day long for months. It was that, incredible. That's some innovative thinking. <laughs> so, I'm sure he was grateful to be over there, whatever he was doing yeah, before. So. Yeah, he loved it. And so – and we would, it was, it was rowdy. We're busting space all day. I'm, I'm, I'm not lying. It was probably six hours a day of playing space. <laughs> my God, I do so, love spades, but I don't know if I can yeah. do it that often. <laughs> but it was, we'd, you know, we'd read the newspaper and then we'd, we'd play spades for several hours a day, but it was great. So I go off to class, OSBT, um, you know, there's 13 of us. A lot of them, the guys are still around. A lot of them have yeah. already made Colonel. And, oh, really? Yeah. There's a few of them. Some, there's one or two of them that are going to do really well. And, so you guys went. You you got chosen as a missile leader. No, this is oh, you this did. is where it comes in. So assignments go out, and there's 13 of us, and there's like they handed out three. There's one guy went to Cavalier, one guy, two guys went to GPS, one SOPS or two SOPS. Yeah. two SOPS. yeah. One guy went to one SOPS, and then everybody else was missiles, and there was about three of us that got banked because our security clearances, the the TS piece hasn't gone through yet. So oh. I was one of those guys that got banked. Okay. And so, so I had to wait. Either my TS is going to come through or they're going to hook me. Probably not, but hopefully you cross your fingers, you're going to hook you up with space or something. Yeah. So they said, well, you know what? Hey, Sean, we're going to send you down to ASBC, which is aerospace. It was ABC at the time, aerospace basic course, huh. which is a precursor to SOS. So lieutenants would go down there Whoa. and learn how to be a lieutenant. Right. And it's, yeah. It's ridiculous. It's a waste of time. So you just got out of ROTC. You just got out of OTS. You just got out of the academy. You don't need to be reblued. So so they sent us down there. And it's at, it's at Maxwell. And just like SOS, you know, same same thing. So I'm down there. And probably the second week into it, we're down at the officer's club. There's a theme again. We're drinking beer. <laughs> um, we're down there playing crud. You know, that's, I guess that's what officers do in space. Right? So they, they go play crud. So I'm learning how to play this game. I'm like, I'll go upstairs and get some more pictures of beer. So I walk in. I'm wearing, you know, blue jeans, shirt, baseball cap. Yeah. yeah. Walk up to the officer's club, and there's five lieutenant colonels in their blues sitting around. And I walk in, and one guy starts ringing the bell. I'm looking around. Oh. I'm like, why is he ringing this bell? Oh, no. And the one lieutenant colonel is like, hey, come over here. I'm looking behind me. He's like, no. I'm, he goes, I'm talking to you. So I go over there. I'm scared shit. Let's say lieutenant. Yeah. He's like, you're not supposed to be wearing a hat in the officer's club. I'm like, I didn't know that. He goes, now you do. You need to buy some beers for the rest of us. <laughs> I said, okay. I said, would two pitchers do it? He's like, perfect. So he started sitting down and talking to me and everything else. He goes, what are you doing? He goes, well, I'm an, I'm an, a, I'm an ABC. Well, what, what? He goes, I'm a second lieutenant. I'm at Vandenberg. I'm a TDY here doing ABC. He goes, well, what do you, what do you learn? Or what do you, what career path? He goes, well, I'm, I'm in space and missiles. You know, I'm I'm waiting. You know, I got banked. I'm not I'm not sure if I'm gonna be a space guy or a missile guy waiting on clearance. And he goes, Well, what do you think about the course and everything else? I start talking to him, like it's fun, I'm learning a lot, you know, coming from you know, straight out of college and everything else. And yeah. so we talked for probably 30 minutes and you know, we drank quite a few beers, a couple of beers. Yeah. And I said, I said, sir, sir, if you don't mind me asking, his name was Lieutenant Colonel Knuckles. And I said, Sir, you don't mind me asking, what do you what do you do? He goes, Well, I'm the chief of space and missile assignments at AFBC. Oh, I said, really? And so we just continued talking and asked me a thing. And right before I left, I was probably bullshitting with him for about an hour. And yeah. I wrote down my name, my social security number on the napkin. And when I got back to Vandenberg, I had to sign it to Vandenberg doing launch. Because he asked me what I want to do. I said, well, I'd like to do launch yeah. at Vandenberg yeah. or Cape Canaveral. Or if I have to do missiles, I want to do go to Maelstrom because it's kind, of, it's kind of northwest. Okay. He said, okay. Yeah. So I got back. I had an assignment to Vandenberg and the rest is history. 
Oh, man. <laughs> It'll you cost know, me two pictures of beer, Marty. Two pictures. You've lived a charmed military life. So. <laughs> Lucky. <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, uh, for for every one good story you just told, I've heard where some guy got screwed on an assignment or he didn't get the, or everything else. I'm like, that's awesome. Because nobody begrudges that. Because it's like, oh, I wish I would have had that. And everybody does. So that's awesome. Especially drinking with the guy. This guy could have been... Uh, on his way to retire or something, they had no influence. But you just have to, re- you just have to exactly be the jobs guy. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I ran into him probably three years later. I was at Cape Canaveral TDY. He's an 06 now. He's the chief of safety at Cape Canaveral. Oh wow! And I ran into him and I said, "Hey, sir, do you remember me?" He goes, "Yeah." He kind of smirked a little bit. I said, "Hey, I really appreciate this assignment." He's just because I don't know what you're talking about. And then <laughs> that was it. So <laughs> that's awesome. I, one thing you didn't cover, and I want, and I wanted to get it because uh, everybody blows by it, even me when I tell a story about. It. But um, getting commission was getting commission the thing for you, or was it just kind of like, oh, you know, I know it's coming, tack it on, shake hand, let's get out of here, or was it kind of, did it kind of hit you like, hey, you're you're an officer now, you know, you take a different oath, you take a, you know, there's there's more weight to it. It's uh, kind of what you've been working towards. Um, did it hit you at all different or was it just kind of the same? I, I think it, um, I, yes, you had, both, you had yeah. both perspectives and most people don't, you know, most people don't have that. So, so I, I understand, I understood the importance of it and I understood the responsibility of it. And as a second Lieutenant, you don't really understand that until you're a lot older, True, but it was so important important to me that I accomplished something. It wasn't just getting commissioned, but it was getting my degree, doing yeah. well enough in school, which I did not do well in high school, as I mentioned, yeah. um, yeah. to be able to get through the program, get along with the folks and learn how to, you know, communicate better. Um, yeah. Learn that's not, you know, pound your chest, I'm better than you type, but soft leadership skills, which you have to kind of do in RTC because that you True. get judged and ranked accordingly, you know, upon that. So, um, it was probably more, it was more of my mother being so proud Uh of me, of what my brother and I accomplished. And I don't think she understood the full concept of it because you ask her the difference between a chief master sergeant and a four-star general, and she can't tell you the difference, which is not a lot of difference really, but a bad example, but there's, there's, there's different perspectives of it. Right. But like, a, a tech sergeant and a captain, like she wouldn't know the difference between the two. They both serve and everything else, but she understood officer was different. And so, um, did you so both she, get pinned on the same day? We did. We did. Oh, and I, I, I technically, he outranked me. No, I don't know if you know the rules about this, about rank, which I did some research. So if you are commissioned on the same day, I'm I'm, I'm going to have to go way back to my member here. Okay. It goes by your data rank. It goes about date and service, which we both came in and listed same day. It goes by birthday, which we both have the same birthday. And then it goes reverse order of social security number. And mine was a, my last two digits was three, five. His was oh nine. So my five beat his nine. So I technically outranked him. So that's how it works. So they, they, it really has reverse order of social security yes. number. Yes, Holy it does. Yeah, that's a that's a petty son of a bitch who forced them to put that rule in there. You know what I mean? Because somebody stood yeah. up and goes, "Hey, I outranked that guy." Exactly, <laughs> but I don't care who did it. I enforced it, and so um, you know, it's my point. <laughs> brother, so, think of your mother. She got both her sons commissioned on the same day. That's that's. Outstanding. That yeah, is outstanding. Super, she was super, super proud. And my dad, my dad as well. I mean, both super proud. Yeah. Um, and she loved the idea that she had, it didn't matter when we were listed or officer. She loved the fact yeah. that she had two boys in the military. She That's, loved it. Yeah. Yeah. After 9 11, you sure. know, it was like the admiration of military service members. It was just, it was something that she loved dearly. So, was she, she had to be a little bit nervous though, because you got commissioned in May. And then 9-11 happens there in September. And 
I mean, her first thought is like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. I got well, two officers she's... who may be going somewhere, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was, a, you know, as a space guy, so I'm like, she's too concerned about, too, okay. too concerned about me. But my brother, I mean, he, fl- he flew, flies still. Um, so well, he did. What did he go fly? So he flew KC 10s. Okay. Um, out, of, out of Travis, but he was in pilot school for, you know, like a year, right? So, yeah. Right. right. So he didn't get out of pilot school. I mean, it was like 2003, but he was, you know, 2003 is when we picked up. Was it? It was Iraq, right? When we Iraq. Uh, yeah, and, that's when we. Yeah, yeah so, we turned and inexplicably, yeah. well, explicably, but inexplicably. Yeah. Um, so he he was gone a lot, you know, and he had two young babies, and I and, and I look yeah. back at my decision for 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 not going down that road, and I'm interesting how you could see the results of not making that decision play out with your brother. Yeah, exactly. And he doesn't regret it by any means. I mean, he doesn't oh, look back and say, oh, you know, gosh, I wish I would have done this. I mean, he has, he's had a successful career. But, no, and if there's a um, time to yeah. go, it's when the kids are young anyway, because they don't yeah, remember exactly. anyway. So um, exactly. what was your, uh, uh, I'm always curious about, not your first salute, because I know your first salute is all antiseptic and it's just, it's, you know, you give them a silver dollar and whatever. But your first salute from like a real enlisted person. Was that kind of was that weird or how did it catch you off guard or how, how did yeah. that? Work? I think you know before nine eleven you'd come through the gate and they would salute you, wave you through the gate, and salute yeah, you. Sure. That, that to me always gave me like a little smirk on my face, <laughs> thinking I'm probably a lot cooler than I am. But I always appreciated that, and I always respected the fact that um, you know still the line from Band of Brothers, right? You don't salute the person, you salute the rank type thing. True, right? Um, right. And I always got a giggle on that. My and my family always loved it. Like, you know, that's super cool. I think the coolest thing was my grandfather um, commissioned um, my brother and I. He was a he ah. was a torpedo bomber in World War II. So he flew Whoa. TBMs off the, the same plane that George Sr. flew. Yeah, yeah. But he flew off the, the Shangri-La. And um, so he got a commission, my, my brother and I, which I think he was super, super proud of that. The fact that he, wow. I remember he, he was probably 80, young 80s, young 80s at the time, but. Uh, late seventies, maybe, but he he started reading the the oath of office, right? And he just started reading the entire thing. And we're like, stop, stop. We don't Wait. know it. We don't know it. Just little pieces, please. <laughs> but uh, it was, a, I think, it was a super proud moment um, for him as well. So, did you just have the four and two requirement? Yeah, yeah it was just a yeah, four year requirement. Yeah. Um, plus plus two. I don't think it was four and four. I think it was four and two plus two reserves or two inactive reserves. Right. Days. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. But you know, the time I finished my first gig, you know, I already had three years active, two years guard, four years. I'm at, you know, I'm at seven, eight years. I'm like, yeah. it's already yeah. sold. Yeah. You know? Is that the, is that the point that you were like, I'm going career now? I think the point was, um, you know, it's kind of where I met you is, you know, I, they started the new 380th Space Control Squadron, right? So I talked to a few people. Yeah. I came off active duty. I tried the contractor gig just for a little bit. Oh, you so did? Really interesting. Yeah, just not very long. I worked for uh, Integral Systems doing, you know, wideband or not wideband, but the the ground station for discus and wideband. Um, doing a little bit of that work, um, which I didn't like at all, um, um, at all, to be honest with you, because I think we were. I think it's different when you're still in the reserves yeah. you're working you're working for a paycheck you're not working for a career yeah yeah and i didn't enjoy it because there was no when you're in the military you're, you're doing well because you want to advance to the next rank the next job the next position and you you do well when when i was a contractor i just worked and made sure i got my 40 hours so i, I did that for about a year and then so i joined the three that's where i met robert cherry obviously yeah. and then, so him and i so I've been at the company, I get back from, let me see. I got out in August. I think August I got out of active duty, joined the reserves, got the contract gig, deployed immediately with the 383rd. So Robert Cherry and I went to the Space Fundamentals course in March. So started the company in August. In March, we were at Vandenberg for two months going to school, and then we deployed immediately after that for the Silent Century gig. Right. Um, so... I wasn't really a contractor very long. So I get back from the deployment. I'm a contract for a little bit and then drop, drop acid. Colonel acid <laughs> offered me an AGR position um, shortly after I get back. So I'm, and my contractor gig was short lived at best. 
Yeah. So, um, so the kind of the rest was history. What, what what year did you get out of active then? About uh, two thousand and seven. How come you got out of active? I mean, uh, you were, you were had to be. I don't know how many years you had up in that oh, or retired. So, you know, that, that's a great question. Again, Mark, <laughs> great question. Like, what what is my thought for this? Um, I wasn't sure. Um, there was talk about making a you know. So I did launch at Vandenberg for my first three years. Yeah. I did WGS. I get to Colorado Springs. I'm in the squadron two years. We don't even have a satellite launched yet. Oh, geez. And I was a little bit frustrated with that. Yeah. And now they're talking about bringing these second year assignments up to get missile experience. Oh, and no. Like, eh. oh. And then, you know, and then I ran into like Bob Claude and a couple of these other guys that I've met and talked to me about this new organization being stood up. This and you were a captain at that time, right? I was. I was a two year captain, kind of a baby captain, really. And yeah. And so I started talking to him. I really I fell in love with the people. I mean, it was, yeah. I was the initial cadre of the 380th. I mean, you're talking like there's eight of us. Yeah. I mean, it was a small group of people. And it was, it was interesting to say the least, um, <laughs> personality wise. I mean, you, you know the people. Um, yes. So it was interesting. And I enjoyed the camaraderie. I enjoyed this small group. And we didn't know it would grow into something as big as it ended up being. But, I just loved it and I just kind of fell in love with it. And I, you know, became, unfortunately along the way, I, you know, I got, I, um, but my first deployment, I ended up um, getting divorced. And I was a single dad at the time. Yeah. yeah and nice. so, um, so I was raising two boys by myself and um, the AGR opportunity came and I'm like this, I love the military. I don't really like being a contractor. Right. If, if I got to pick up my kids at three o'clock because somebody's sick, it's a lot different being on active duty than it is being a contractor where you got to make those hours up some more. Um, true. Yeah, true. Anyways, so I just kind of went down that road and I loved the mission. I thought the mission was super cool and I loved signal stuff. I never thought I had a head for something like that. Really? I loved it. I really, I, I understood it. I enjoyed yeah. it and I just, I had a knack for it. I really enjoyed it. So. When did you become an AGR? What year? Um, 2008. 2008. Okay. 2008. Yeah. You know, how did you just retire in 2019? So I, um, 2008 did that until. I'm sorry, uh, I don't, I'm not trying to no, make it an inquisition here, but I'm like, your timeline is one of the screwiest timelines I've it, ever. It heard. is. So I did start AGR in 2008. I went to, did another appoint, deployment in 2010, yeah. um, South Century. Came back 2011, I PCS and went to the ninth um, at Vandenberg to the okay. J Spawn. Okay. And did my three years, which I didn't love. I love the area. Right. Did right. not love that organization. I'm saying I love the people. I didn't yeah. love some of the leadership. But that is a um, beast. It is. Um, so I didn't enjoy my time out there. I didn't. I wasn't satisfied with the job. Yeah. Um, did my three years. Oh, I toughed it out, and then came time, and then the aggressors had a spot that opened up, an ADO job, and I'm like, oh, that's my dream. It's my. I love signals. My dream organization. Yeah, yeah. And I, I got a, a job, an ADO job, which turned into the the DO position there at the um, aggressors. I was, I was there for four four years. Okay. And then went out to Herbert Field, did my two my two last years, and then um, decided to retire. I had two kids in high school. Yeah. Um, it's gonna it was gonna cost me one more move probably, and I didn't want to uproot them. And that yeah. Just, you know, I had twenty plus years active duty, and I just. And I said, that's it. Yeah. You know, you got to make so, those decisions. I'm a huge fan of, you know, you, you make the decision you make and you own it and yeah. you accept it. And, and the cards fall is I, I don't have any regrets in my life of any of the decisions I've made. I mean, I probably drank too much beer a couple of times um, <laughs> besides those decisions. Um, but like her decisions and family decisions and yeah. packing my family up and say, Hey, you know, I didn't have to leave Colorado Springs um, in 2011. Oh. Yeah. But I, I felt stale at the, you know, I'd been in, in the 380th for, right. Shit, it was, you know, 2007, like, what's that? I can't do public math, four or five years. Yeah, that's a long and time. So I was like, I'm just like, uh, like, I'm stale. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going anywhere. I'm look, and I look at the people above me, you know, you've got Shaq Khan, you've got Bob Claude, yeah. you've yeah. got, you know, you've got all these people like, these guys aren't leaving. Matt Winger was a year senior to me. I'm like, I gotta go do something to separate myself. Otherwise, you know, I'm going to retire as a major, and I don't really want to retire as a major. So. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it, 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 
becomes, especially when you're an AGR, it becomes that choice between location or career advancement. Exactly. If you're lucky, you get both, but only a very few get both. So, and that's that's true. And I, I didn't want to self eliminate myself. So, so we chose to go out to California, and I look back, and I I don't know if it was a great decision, but I I did like the people. It really, the I love the enlisted people there more than anything. Yeah. The great, still great friends to this day. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, some phenomenal people. Um, but. But I got back to the, I got back to Colorado Springs, um, you know, you know, hang out with my buddies again. I mean, it's, yeah. and you know what it is, Martin, that organization, the, just the three tenth in general, such a small ancestral organization that it's good and bad. I, I love it. I actually love it. It's all the friendships I've made over the years. So, there's so many great stories. I, I wish I had like five hours with you and I'll share one more with you. Um, yeah, give me one. With, um, when I was at uh, my, it's my either my first or second rotation um, to Turkey. We we broke down in Milton Hall, England, and then the, our maintenance officer, Lieutenant Colonel, uh, was with us, and kind of an older dude. I don't know if he was prior service or what, but he seemed like he was like sixty years old. He's probably like forty five, but when I was eighteen, it seemed like he was really old. And he loved British motorcycles. Okay, and he drove an old he drove an old like nineteen seventies little Beamer car and everything else. So we broke down. Um, in Melbourne Hall. And then as soon as he found out we broke down, we never saw him for a week. Gone. Never saw him. Oh, no. and, <laughs> now, when you're and, saying you broke down, the plane broke down, so there's nothing you can do, right? There's you're nothing waiting, you can do, right? You're it's, waiting out the parts or whatever. Waiting apart, and it wasn't an engine part, thank God. Otherwise, we've been stuck working. So all you saw was the ass of his uniform, and he was gone, right? Yeah, and he was gone. And he didn't really care. Like, go fix the plane. Let me know when it's ready. <laughs> so we were there probably three days, three or four days. Okay. And he... He, I, I heard rumblings and I saw evidence of it, but he would come back to the plane every so often okay, with stuff. And so we get back and we go through the customs bit and everything else. And we're all cleared. You know, we get this on our way back from our rotation and we get back to the Eglin and we parked everything else. And all of a sudden, you know, the, the, the crew van comes out and grabs everybody and the box van, the maintenance van comes out and there's, there he is pulling pieces of an old BMW motorcycle that he's got stashed all through the airplane. I'm mean, broken down by bolt pieces, tires, and all hidden within the oh. C-130 that he got. <laughs> really? <laughs> so there were so many shenanigans like that. Like, again, our C-130 was a refueler, so they had this big, huge Benson tank in the back that would refuel helicopters. Oh, and cool. that thing would be empty usually on the way home because we didn't we weren't dragging any helicopters. There yeah. would be so much stuff in that thing of <laughs> people, you know, just you name it. It was in there. Booze, booze that you can't have in the States. Right. I mean, you name it. There was just so much contraband. It was disgusting. So anyways, <laughs> I one, of, like, one of the reasons I do this podcast is because it links us, right? <laughs> Not only through common experiences, but also, you know, people we know. And uh, as you know, earlier I I had an interview with Chief Master Sergeant Cherry, and you guys deployed out to uh, Al Yadid Cutter together, correct? In two thousand eight, he was um, he was my I was the crew commander, and he was the the senior. He was the superintendent for the deployment. So why don't you finish this interview off and and take a second and give me your best Chief Cherry story? Out there in the desert of Cutter. Boy, I've got a good one. I've got a really good one. So, and thank you for asking because I I didn't write that down on my list of things I was going to talk to you about. But this oh, is good. Classic, good. This is classic. This is senior master. Sir. This is before Chief Cherry. Yeah. This is the the artist formerly known as Chief Master Sergeant Cherry, Senior Master Sergeant Cherry, and <laughs> he was the. I mean, and you know him better than most people that listen to this podcast probably. That just a great, great dude. Just he is. a phenomenal chief, phenomenal friend. Yeah. Name it. He's he's one of my best friends to this day. And so we were out there and we had a deployment commander. And the active duty squadron commander back at, at Peterson did not like our deployment commander. And he was a reservist and did not like him at all. And he would do anything he could to disrupt whatever. But anyways. So the active duty squadron commander comes out to the desert and he's just going to, he's doing a site visit to, I'm sure to get his 
one month tax free and has oh, yeah. pay and all the other good stuff. So he's out there for a week. No reason and for him to be out there, right? Really, there's no reason for him to be out there at all. Okay. And he he has made this this officer will who we will not name. Yeah, he made comments before we deploy. This says if you break this system, I'll give you guys all accommodation medals. I mean, he would make comments Jesus. like that just because he didn't like the system. Because I mean, and I I don't really understand. I and mean, this is helping the warfighter, but he didn't like the fact that there's no sustainment tail to this thing. It was just a, it was a it was a pet project that I could put on there and it's assigned to his unit. And he did not like it. Okay. So. So he comes out and does a site visit and everything else. And nobody likes this guy. But he started, this squadron commander, started interviewing everybody out at this location, out at Silent Century, about our deployment commander and his leadership and the things that he's doing wrong. Well, by the way, we are assigned to a squadron out in LUD, as you know. Yeah. We're not part, you know, we're an expeditionary force, so we have a squadron commander. Well, it got wind that from our group commander out at the desert that this squadron commander was coming in here and interviewing his people because now they're his people. Yeah. And he's, and he comes over and he's, and he's not very happy. And so he comes over to the tent and says, Hey, is such and such, is he coming over today? Yes. Like, well, he said he was going to come in late this afternoon. He stayed late last night. He said, okay. Hey, cause I got a bunch of means this afternoon. Are you, one of you comfortable with, ensuring he does not enter this compound and confining him to his quarters. <laughs> and then Robert's like, I got this. <laughs> Love to. I'll tell him. <laughs> so, so, so Robert and I, we're getting all excited. Like, oh, this is like 11 o'clock. He's going to be out there like at one. Our deployment commander, not, not the strongest back in the world. Yeah. So he, He's like, Robert and I are like, hey, let's, how about you and I go to lunch? Let's go get our chicken sandwiches because this is on Friday. They got the best chicken sandwiches on Friday. Yeah. Let's go get our chicken sandwiches. We'll get back here and then we can tell this guy that he's confined to his quarters and he can't come on the property and he's got to fly. By the way, the group commander says, we will fly him out tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. He's out. He's, he's off my base. Period. <laughs> and so, so Robert and I, we zip over like, hey, everybody know he's not allowed on the compound. Okay. Everybody's got it. So we go back to, we go over to the defect. We get our chicken sandwiches, which were glorious. <laughs> we come back and guess who's on site? Oh, no. The squadron commander. I'm like, son of a bitch. He, see, he, what he, part of, what he, part of this? He's like, <laughs> what are you guys doing? <laughs> and so we look at the deployment commander. He's over there just, he hung around. And Robert Cherry goes over and goes, sir, you have to go to your room. We will escort you back to your room. You're not allowed on site. And you know how he is, just straight faced, yeah. not a shiver in his voice. Right. And so he's like, he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Da, da, da. And I'm like, or Robert's like, you have to go. Colonel such and such said, you're not allowed on here. Period. Up. And you know, he felt it. They're like, okay, yep, this is serious. So yeah. our deployment commander says he's got the keys and he should have drove him back to the site. He did it. Oh, scared to death <laughs> and so he hands the keys to tech sergeant such and such who's in this guy's unit he's an active duty guy and says hey you need to drive him home and t- sergeant such and such is over there just shaking what? Like, like, like I'm like oh my like, god damn it give me the fucking keys so I grab the keys and drive his ass home I'm like you're such a pussy so I drive his ass home and he's sitting there talking to me just chirping he goes I, I hope you understand where I'm coming from I'm like sir I'm just allowed to take you to your room Nice. That's all I'm supposed to do. He's just sitting there trying to get stuff out of me. I'm like, sir, can't talk about. It. So I drop him off at the room. So he's like three or four rooms down from us. Were you were you deployed out there? Pardon? Yeah, yeah. I so you remember the rooms, right? And everybody had a whiteboard, right? right? Yeah, you could write. So them every day. So he was actually out there for like two more days. Oh shit! Before they, flew, before they flew him out, but he was not allowed on site. And so he was allowed to go to the chow hall and to the bathroom. That was it. <laughs> so every day. You know, every day Robert and I walk past his room, and his name was Lieutenant Colonel such and such. Robert and I would wipe off the Colonel every day <laughs> off his whiteboard, just to let him know that we know who he is. <laughs> it was such a childish thing, but we enjoyed it. And him and I, Robert and I, still we don't talk about it like some other people do. Yeah, um, but it was it just Robert 
was not scared of anything. That's true. And it, rank did not bother him. It didn't matter status or power. If it's wrong, it's wrong. And he's going to tell you. It, 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 this, yeah, it was a rare individual that way. Yeah. 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 And I just have so much respect for him. And that was the time I was going through my divorce when I was out there. And I mean, he's just, just a great person that just would pick me up. And just he's just a great dude. And I will never never forget what he did for me. And I, I, I couldn't think of him. No. So just a great dude. So anyways, like that's, my, that's my Robert Cherry story. Which I have some, <laughs> a lot of others, but they do not require um, us in the military, but more up at Keystone. Yeah, sure, sure, so, fair sure. enough, fair enough. Well, we'll exclude that from its military. <laughs> Retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Sean Masterson. God, thanks for sharing the story, man. It's been a privilege to to get it and to talk with you today. I really appreciate it. Well, well, thank thanks for asking me, Marty. I think what you're doing is fantastic, and I actually started listening to your podcast just a few months ago. I think Jake Wall was my first, and I really enjoy what you're doing, and it's it's great. To and I know Jake pretty well to hear <laughs> things that I've never heard before from Jake, which is just super exciting. I, I knew Jake for 20 years before that, and I didn't know his story, so that's what you know. And it and it it'll go off into the ether if I don't try to catch these. That's what yeah. I. So. But thanks for sharing yours, Sean. I really appreciate it, man. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. You too. Thanks, Marty. On behalf of Lieutenant Colonel Masterson. I'd like to thank you for listening today. I do hope you enjoyed the show, and if you did, please leave a like or a comment and share the podcast with someone else. And as always, make sure to download the next episode for more service origin stories. So until next time, a dance hoot!